This was an SS and Gestapo barracks and the first Nazi concentration camp located on the western edge of Poznan. It was one of the largest extermination camps for Polish elites in all of Poland. It was controlled by the SS and the Gestapo. Prisoners lived in cramped, dark, damp and cold conditions. They suffered from cold and hunger and were regularly tortured and then usually killed. Prisoners here were often transported to Gestapo headquarters in the soldiers' home, where they were brutally interrogated. Interrogations were also held in the fort. Now this is obviously not as well known as the Auschwitz concentration camp, but it doesn't stop it being a concentration camp. Imagine the last time you would have seen free civilization before you enter these gates. Thankfully, we get to leave today, but many who came before us didn't get to leave. This is Poznanski Slack Fort Zneki. I think it's Poznaki Slack Fort, Fortress. I really hope it's in English, because none of this is in English. I hope I can get some information. Well, I've got my guidebook and I've got my ticket. As you can see, I'm pretty much the only person here in terms of tourists. A lovely man in the office. 45 zloty to get in. That also bought me this very thick guidebook, which I'm going to read as I go. But you can imagine people were brought in here by vehicles. Unlike Auschwitz, there were no trains to here, but they were brought in here. It's called Fort 7, because all around Poznan were these forts when Prussia effectively had Poland. But let's have a look. This Nazi camp in occupied Poland is thought to be the first Nazi concentration camp and it was set up as soon as Poznan was seized by the Z-Germans in 1939. The decision to establish the Nazi camp in Poznan, made by the Reich governor of the region, happened on the 25th of September 1939. The fort originally was one of the 19th century forts which ringed the city. On the 3rd of October 1939, the Wehrmacht soldiers of the 148th Infantry Regiment took guard of the fort and a week later the facility was taken over by the security police. At the time it was under the command of Erich Norman. He was SS Oberführer of Einsteiglapu 6. In mid-November 1939 the camp became Konzentrationslager Posen or Ubergangslager Fort 6 and was made into a Gestapo prison and transit camp. From mid-1941 the official name was the Security Police Prison and the Correction Labor Camp. Fort 6 was also called Lager der Blutschlash by the Germans, a camp of bloody revenge. Up here you can still see the fascist symbol, as you can see on the main gates, the fascist symbols side by side and the fascism here. Now the panel over the main entrance gate today features the inscription Concentration Slager Posen. It was reconstructed on the basis of old films shot at the time when Fort Six was a concentration camp. The film was found by the staff of the Martyrs Museum in Zablakov. The original SS letters on the keystone were hidden under a layers of paint for many years. However, they have been faithfully restored, hence we can now see the past today. The fortress was originally finished in 1864. As you can see, this is central Poznan here, where there's a fortification around Poznan. But where we are over here, we are here, and this is Fort 7. This was eventually taken over from 1939 to 1945 by the Nazis. But you've got to realize this, this entire fortress from the 1860s onwards protected Poznan. It was one of the most fortified towns anywhere in Europe. And the reason they were spread out like this, it allowed communication between the fortresses, but it also allowed this fort, Fort 7, to defend Fort Villa. Fort Villa Strafta could defend, and likewise, all of them could defend each other. Firing, firing. It was almost impenetrable. Truly amazing. This would have been the place where people may have had the opportunity to wash themselves but the conditions would have been harsh. 15 to 17,000 prisoners came through here. Some even suggest that some came here for one or two days and may have been up to 40,000 prisoners. When they would have come, they were beaten relentlessly. They were generally covered in blood, teeth were smashed, noses broken, blood would be drenching the floor. 
as they were just beaten to a pulp. Very few people survived. Out of the 17,000 that were thought to have been here, maybe 5,000 perished. Those that weren't perished here were taken out to be executed in the forests, and then some were taken to other concentration camps, numerously dotted around Poland and other countries, such as Auschwitz. Some would be taken there. Dark history, a fascinating place at the same time. I've you have to forgive me. I realized as I was reading this, what I assumed were the fascist symbols. It says SS. It was the SS camp. So the SS were here. But what sort of prisoners were brought to this one? Generally, it was the gentry, it was the elites of Poland. Lists had been drawn up before the invasion of Poland in 1939. People that they thought would potentially cause trouble once the occupation had began. So professors, those deemed very intelligent, teachers even, they were brought here, those that could be classed as dissidents. And as we see here, all of the names of the different concentration camps that people were subjected to, Auschwitz over here, this in the Bergen-Belsen, Cross Rosen, people forced to wear the striped pajamas, bodies eventually piled up, you can see these bodies here, men working, knowing that they are on the list and it probably will be inevitable that this person born in 1920 would die in 1942, Marian Lakomi. Speaking of Marian, it's actually a male name in Poland and the only person to escape this place was a Marian in 1942, but they escaped, climbed over the barbed wire with a hook that they sort of would have barbed wire here, climbed over, escaped, found themselves for the rest of the war hiding out, working on a farm until the Germans were taken out of Poland and they could go back to living there. What would then be a normal life after that, deal with the consequences of the life that they now had to endure. The prisoners were mostly represented by the region's intelligentsia, and professors and teachers and people engaged in social and political life. Veterans of the Velko Polska uprising and the Silsing uprisings, as well as priests and monks. Virtually anybody who could be suspected of underground activity and fighting the occupiers in the future, they were rounded up. They were persecuted in the framework of a political cleansing operation, and they got arrested and imprisoned on the basis of the so-called prescription lists prepared by the Nazis prior to the outbreak of war. With time, Fort Six became a prison for members of the clandestine organizations, e.g. the Polish Military Organization, the Military Organization of Western Territories, the National Fighting Organization, and the Union of Armed Struggle, as well as persons caught during roundups. Starting in mid-1941, Fort Six also became a prison for people who evaded work for the Germans. These prisoners would be held in the camp temporarily between ending work on Saturday and beginning work on Monday. Having served their time in prison, they often changed their attitude to work since they did not want to return to the prison ever again. Other prisoners were kept in the fort for correctional purposes for two weeks to two months. Occasionally, real criminal prisoners were actually locked in the fort. As they had no scruples, they were often nominated as cell elders and their duties included informing the camp command of the prisoners' conduct. They were reported as being incredibly brutal people. As we head down, I think I'm doing this backwards. I'm sure it doesn't matter. It probably means that history is now going in reverse. We get to learn about how it was built and how it wasn't always a Nazi concentration camp or a Nazi prison. It was actually a home or a base for military personnel. Look, this is before the restoration. Well, this is a different one. You can see how it's graffitied. People are just wanting to forget the past. Who can blame them? I love how this has clearly been restored to give people an idea. You can see gun holes. This actually fell when the Russians attacked in 1944. So the last, one of the last stands, and the first time it was ever put to a test as a fortress was in when the battle of the Russians came through Poznan and they took this fortress and they killed the Nazis that were occupying it. But it was a bloody battle and you could imagine that some people would have been held up here shooting through the hole. Oh. 
when we came in, you may have noticed the SS symbols were splattered with bullets. That's from the remnants of the 1944 battle. Once the original dissidents or potential dissidents had been rounded up and brought here, tortured and effectively taken care of, some were let go, most were not, this was then used as a place to take prisoners who were the resistance of Poland and also the, just those who were involved in minor criminality. They would be brought here, it could have been any time during the occupation between 1939 and 1944. Let's go and have a look inside here. The brutality one can only imagine the fact that the guillotine which we saw back there was used on prisoners. I was reading a story about how a guillotine was used on a lady who was in a wheelchair because she'd basically been a sufferer of polio. Polio had put her in a wheelchair and the Nazis thought even though she was a poet, they took it to the guillotine, similar to the one we saw in that room, ended her life. And this is how prisoners would have been made to stand. Sculptured illustrations of the prisoners. And as we can see here, the cells which I think we can go in and have a look in. Cell 71, I think. Cell 73, you can see the cramped conditions here. Many individuals could have possibly been in a cell here. We have just one, but probably given very little food, very little water, if anything, made to suffer, made to stand in the cold, harsh conditions. You've got to realize that winters in Poland are extremely harsh. the makeshift beds, similar to what you would see in Auschwitz. Probably rats everywhere, the stench because people having to use the toilets in their own rooms. And look at these sculptures the, to remind us of all the people that lost their lives. Cell 69. This would have been the individuals being rounded up. As you can see, being led out for a truck, put against the wall, and then shot. Cell 66, let's have a look. Sporadically, the prison included Soviet prisoners of war and representatives of other nationalities, Ukrainians, Yugoslavs, and some Germans, as well as Jews. For example, at the turn of 1943, Jewish prisoners were forced to dig up and burn bodies of people buried in the mass graves near Poznan. The special Jewish unit was responsible for covering up Nazi crimes. This is a Gestapo truncheon slash whip. And look, a chain which according to testimonies was used to tie prisoners during transport. As you can see, some of it's open, some of it's not. It feels kind of eerie, it feels kind of haunting down here. It's probably the best way to describe it. Just imagining that you've got no idea. Probably when you're brought here, where the hell you are. You may have even come from Poznan, you may have been knocked out. You don't even know that you, you're just down the road from where you used to live. Or maybe you're not, maybe you've been brought hundreds of miles to this place. Some of these names are people that potentially were led into these gas chambers. And like I say, 5,000 died here. Certainly, and you can see bullet holes. Way gives a perspective on how well fortified this fortress would have been, but also how bloody scary it would have been if you were locked up inside.
So how are these sealed up? Effectively, 300 prisoners that were gassed, and when I say gassed, it was carbon monoxide that gassed them. So different to what we hear about at places like Auschwitz. These were sealed with concrete, and then carbon monoxide was somehow poured into this place. I mean, the carbon monoxide could have come from a vehicle. Given that trucks were loading these people, could have been a hose from a vehicle, and then everyone left to die. It is thought that when this happened in 1940, Henrik Himmler was involved and he was watching them, maybe inspiring him to see how more efficiently he could kill people later in the war. But it just goes to show 300 died from the gas chambers here. What we see here are what is known as the death steps or the, or the stairs of death. An SS guard would be standing at the top and prisoners were forced to run up the stairs. And then as they got up the stairs, the SS guard would possibly kick them down the stairs and they'd have to do that again and again. Some of course obviously would die upon impact, some of them were continuing and they'd have to continue doing this. On winter's days, they were forced to run up these steep hills, often forced to turn and slide down on their faces or slide down on their shoulders, often cracking bones, often scraping themselves. But this was a form of torture. Often torturous days happened when the SS or any of the Gestapo guards were paid, which was generally on the 10th, the 20th, and the 30th of the month, or when it was a celebration, maybe 420, April the 20th, Hitler's birthday. There was often celebrations and the celebrations for the SS involved torturing prisoners. But here, the names of the people that would have been gassed or died from carbon monoxide and the shrines of them. Still remembered, despite how long it's now been, still remembered, and rightly so. In a way, stopping people climbing up these awful steps, because you could just imagine how many people may have lost their lives climbing those steps, forced to run up these steps. <sighs> Disposing of the bodies was thought to be extremely hard. Any body that needed to be disposed of was generally buried in mass graves in the surrounding forests. If you think about how difficult it is to dispose of bodies, it is incredibly difficult. And here we've got some barbed wire fencing. We can't go this way. What a beautiful cross at the top of this. It's very peaceful, but you know, this place only gets 40,000 visitors a year. It was only opened in 2013. I feel like it's a place more people should come, but because it was generally the Polish intellectuals and the Polish elites, well, not just the elites, it was, you've got to realize it was the prostitutes. It was the crippled children. It was the girl that was in a wheelchair because of polio. It was the people that were unwanted and not considered useful. They were brought here, but most of the killing and most of the prisoners stopped in 1942. After then, it was just used as a barracks for the Nazis and occasionally a prison. The camp was eventually closed in April 1944. Much of the documents that were contained within the camp are thought to have been destroyed at the end of the war. It was estimated in 1946 that up to 15,000 prisoners were held at Fort Six. More recent estimates suggest that up to 40,000 prisoners were held here, and about 4,500 were killed or died at Fort Six. Many others lost their lives in the forests around Poznan, where there were numerous sites of mass executions, and in other concentration camps where they were later moved. There are only 531 official death certificates in the Registry of Vital Statistics in Poznan of the prisoners of Fort Six. The official causes of deaths included executed by court decision, killed during escape attempt, or died of natural causes, for example heart attacks and pneumonia, which was rife at the prison. Well, that was Fort Seven, and, and I have to say, unsettling. But at the same time, I think we all need to visit these sort of places because it allows us to remember what humans are capable of and what humans are still doing today. If you go to occupied ISIS territories, if you go to places where there's Islamic fundamentalism going on, if you go to the Ukrainian front lines where the Russians are pushing into Ukraine and capturing Ukrainian soldiers and citizens, we know this still happens today. We know that Russians are going into villages and executing Ukrainians just for the sake of it. That's happening in 2023. 
Ferry. And it happened in 1939, it happened in 1940, all the way up until 1945 throughout Europe under Nazi occupation. And then later again, it happened when the Soviets occupied Eastern Europe. They took people off to the gulags, they tortured them, they smashed their faces in, and they executed these people. We are capable of horrific things, but this is not just a European problem, this is a problem throughout the entire world. When will this end? I do not know. When will humans suddenly realize violence is not the answer? Sit down and have a conversation. Western leaders are unprepared to have a conversation with Eastern leaders. Why is the British Prime Minister why is the American president, why is the French president not sitting down with Putin to have a conversation? Oh, Putin is evil, they say. Oh, yes, he's an evil man. Sit down and have a damn conversation because it then avoids this or it stops this. Anyway, I'm a long way from the center. I'm going to go t take in a little park called the Woodrow Wilson Park, a celebration of the liberation of Poland, a park dedicated to Woodrow Wilson. I think I'm gonna have to find another one of those scooters, so wish me luck.